Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's conversation. We are going to head back to the zoo and we have a scat chat at the zoo. Zoo, oh, it's all you. Hi, buddy. I'm Kara King here with another episode of Scat Chat to fill your afternoon. And we're going to have several guests with us today talking about scat. But first, I think we should make sure we know what that term means. Scat is the solid waste release after they've processed their food. So scat is poop, and that's what we're going to be talking about. I'd like to call in our first Emma, who is the, the zoological manager of Tropics Birds. Oh, and she has brought me a lot of fun stuff. So Emma, can you tell us what's in this bowl? Can you see the bowl pretty well? OK, so we've got types of bird poop and then one mammal poop, but you can see that they all pretty much look the same. Over here we have a lot of dove poops. We've got starling or any sort of passerine that you might see that could be like a cardinal you see out in your backyard. Um, and then we've got right here some waterfowl from like a swan or a duck. Down at the very bottom is kua poop. And then this middle one is actually from our free flight fly, uh, Indian flying fox bats in the traffics building. So what are some differences that they might see in these fecal samples? Other than size, based on how big the birds are, um, poop and urates actually in birds, so they all come from the cloaca. So you can see that in the poops you see white and brown. The white is the urates, and then the brown is actually the fecal matter. So they all expel it all at one, one place, one time. Which one do you think is the smelliest? In my opinion, it's the kua poop at the very bottom. Uh -huh. um, it just seems to stick to everything and smell the worst. But I didn't bring our smelliest poops because I didn't want to gas myself out today. So uh, I understand. I do believe we have a guest that's going to do that later. I'll save so, that for them. Um, in the tropics, I mean, poop is kind of gross. We need to keep it picked up to keep everything. A lot of patients do have a horticulturist four times a week with all the tropical plants. Uh -huh. So he does a really good job of spraying off the pathways, spraying off plants, and anything like that. But there's never a shortage of poop in the tropics building. If you look for it, you will find it. Look for yes, it. and it looks like this in her world. <laughs> um, well, I think that's delightful. I Thank would like to, to add that we do have doves in this department and mm -hmm. I hardly I feel like their poop smells like sour cream. It's not pleasant. So it, it has been sort of a good um, weight loss plan for me <laughs> to not cover my tacos in so much sour cream. Yes. So I'm going to let you move okay. down and we're going to call in our next guest. Uh oh, here comes Joe and Joe is getting mic'd up and ready to go. Joe right. works in ASA mammals and he he has brought a little treat. I hope that yes. we're not supposed to eat. But what have you got here, well, Joe? This right here is meerkat poop and there's two different sizes there and they are both meerkat. We actually happen to have babies currently, so we have adult meerkat and baby meerkat poop. And then we also have a tube. And if you see the smears on there, that is also poop. <laughs> or as in the meerkat world, we call it anal paste. What is the purpose of anal pasting? So if you've ever seen dogs sniff each other's butts, it's kind of a similar topic to that. It's kind of where they establish dominance and they you know, we need to spread their scent, especially in the wild where they have different groups. Mm -hmm. And so they need to keep their territory intact. Actually did a favor and kept that outside until <laughs> we started. So I was a little afraid of that it was going to smell bad. Like, me, which I am not going to touch hands. I should have brought gloves. I can see what looks like some mealworm parts. Is that possible? 
Friday in their diet. They have mealworms or crickets. They love insects, probably their favorite snack, uh -huh. especially live. And then they love different right in there. Uh -huh. so insect war based grain as well, and they even meatballs. Well, omnivores have stinky poops. Yes, very, very stinky and poops. You can see the flakes of uh, where we clean it up in latrines. Uh -huh. um, so they poop in one spot based on the smell. That's part of where they put their scent. And so that's they poop in the in their aspen bed bedding. These uh -huh. don't spread everywhere. I think that it's fabulous that you're calling a litter pan a latrine. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the litter pan trained. Yeah, there you go. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much, Joe, cool. for the. Um, the amazing <laughs> array of interesting meerkat poops that you brought with uh, with you today. We're going to have our next guest come up. I'm going to steal your mic. All right, and here comes Blake. Caleb, Caleb sorry. <laughs> I change people's names from time to time. Get him mic'd up. Um, yes, yeah, so what's on my table here? So this is Mr. Jerome. Um, he's been here at the zoo since at least the 90s, so he's a longtime resident here at the zoo, and he currently resides at our elephant barn, um, not on display though. And before we get started, um, I'll have to admit a couple of things to you guys. So if I if I tell some poop jokes, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I'm not going to be able to hold them in at all. <laughs> and uh, I really apologize because um, I know that you guys aren't ready because my poop joke stinks, so. <laughs> They're, they're not my favorite, but they are a solid number two. <laughs> <laughs> He's been practicing. So I, I have to say, I have been here almost 18 years, and I have never seen this fine work of art. Really? I don't know how I've missed it, um, but I feel like I could retire now. <laughs> I feel like I really, I mean, I've seen it all now. So so tell us about what, Jerome? Jerome. Jerome, what, what is Jerome made of? He is made out of poop. I can't remember if he's actually a poop from Stephanie or Cinda, but he is a poop from one of their fine rear ends. Um, and Jerome here, he's like basically the perfect bolus. And I also have another poop to show you. We collected this around 2.30 yesterday. Uh, this is from Arusi, our tussless <laughs> elephant. Uh, she probably has around, well, probably about the smallest turds, but she has the, the perfect elephant bolus. Uh -huh. It's nice and round, compact. It's not goopy or anything. It's just right. It's just right. And the consistency of the the feces can tell you a lot about what's going on with the animal too, right? Oh, definitely. Just, you know, elephants, they only digest about 45, 50% of their poop. So it's really easy to break it apart and see what they've been eating the past day or so. And you can see there's lots and lots of grasses. I heard rumor at one point that it was either Stephanie or Cinda, someone found um, a whole apple. That's true. In, in one of her in one of those bolus so mm -hmm. that that is not a really good breakdown of your food no nope. so because they don't break it down very much do they eat m more compared to an animal that does break down their food well yeah so elephants only well they eat around one to three percent of their body weight um, which doesn't sound like a lot but keep this in mind so our largest elephant johnny weighs over ten thousand pounds so each day he's going to be eating around uh, 100 to 300 pounds of, of food every day. Mm -hmm. And about how many pounds of poop do you guys scoop in a given time? You tell me the time so down we, there. So we care for eight elephants total and we pick up a lot of poop and we were very curious about how many pounds of poop we pick up a day. So we basically became like soldiers and we made it our personal duty to figure this out <laughs> and we got right to the bottom of it. And after weighing our poop after a, a day, we found out that we pick up over 3,500 pounds of poop a day. Wow, that is a lot. Yeah, to give you a perspective, our smallest elephant, Talia, weighs around 4,300 pounds. So we're basically just about picking up an entire elephant a day. Wow. And to think that I used to complain about cleaning the litter van. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing, uh, Mr. Jerome and, and the elephant bolus. I'd like to call our final guest, Brittany. Oh, I got to grab your mic. And Brittany is a vet tech here at Sedgwick County Zoo. And I know we've been doing a lot of laughing and a lot of jokes. 
some were better than others. <laughs> But there really is, there is a level of importance with the scat or defecation or fecal matter. It has all kinds of names that, um, that we need. We need information from this material and Brittany is the one who gathers that information. So could you yeah. tell us a little bit about the things that you can learn from a fecal sample? Yeah, absolutely. So these guys may scoop a lot of poop, but I've seen every animal's poop here at the zoo, so that's pretty cool too. <laughs> Maybe 3,000 pounds of it, I don't know. Um, but every animal here at the zoo gets what we call a fecal exam twice a year. Hopefully, some animals don't poop all that often, so they might get missed. But what we're doing is we look to see if they're sick. So stool does tell you a lot of information, but really it'll tell you what they've got going on inside. A lot of parasites are found in the gastrointestinal tract. So the food goes in, the poop comes out, there's worms in there sometimes. So what we're doing is we look for the eggs from those worms in the poo. And we have a whole process that we do. I won't go into it, it's stinky. <laughs> but we are looking for ova. So these are just different eggs that have been found in fecals. And this is an example from a goat. So you might see different kinds of eggs. Each of these is a different worm that produced these. And these worms here in the middle, they're called strongyl worms. And we do see those alive in poo sometimes. Now, a lot of our animals will have these and it's natural to have them. But other animals, we treat them for them if they're dangerous or at high levels. We have a garter snake in our department. You guys may have seen her earlier. She comes up with the the strongid in her fecal a lot, but it's because she's eating earthworms, I understand. Yes. Okay, and so do our earthworms a vector for those strongile? They absolutely uh, can be. Uh -huh. um, different species have different worms. So goat worms don't necessarily translate to humans. And what happens with snakes that eat, or animals that eat other animals whole, sometimes the eggs and everything that are in those then transport to the higher animal. So the snake eats the mouse, the mouse has, or the earthworms, and they have the worms in them. Mm -hmm. So how do we treat for things like worms and well, fun stuff. Fun stuff we treat with medications most mm -hmm. often. There's a whole range of medication. Each animal has their own. Um, it could be something called fenbendazole, panicure, all kinds of different things. Ivermectin uh -huh. treats worms. So we just treat them with medication and hope they get better. Yes, ivermectin treats worms. It and treats worms. animals. Yes. Um, what are what are your tubes? So I, some animals, they get worms and we don't catch them in time, so they get big worms. So I have, we have a museum in our vet hospital oh. that we keep specimens from different animals. So these here are, what I'm guessing, are roundworms. They're very much dead. <laughs> Been dead for a long time. And then I brought a couple of examples of tapeworms. Ew. So one is from a monitor lizard and the other was just pulled out of one of our riverbanks exhibit. Ew. So in vet med, when we find something cool that other people might think is disgusting, we keep them. Yeah. Yeah, go look in my office. We do yeah. the same thing. It's yeah. full of my house too, mm -hmm. full of bones, weird mm -hmm. stuff. So there is, really important information in the scat that we gather up here at the zoo. It helps us um, know nutritional levels. It helps us um, diagnose illness. It's important for us to know what's going in and what's coming out because some animals actually get um, blockages. And if they're not defecating, then that's a problem because that waste has to, to be expelled or else the animal could get sick. What would happen to an animal that was, um, um, let's just say a pixie frog or a giant African bullfrog who eats um, crickets but also eats the moss 
that the crickets were on. What would happen to that animal in, if it got impacted or it got too yeah. much moss? So we do, we call that a fecal impaction. And a lot of our animals will eat stuff off of sand or dirt, and we can sometimes measure it in feces. I know elephants, we keep track of if they produce sand with their fecal passing or mm -hmm. not. Um, so a fecal impaction is everything gets stuck up in there that's maybe not supposed to be in there and nothing can move. So usually to correct that, you would do surgery. Mm -hmm. um, my brother's dog, awesome dog, but I can't believe he did this. We went camping and he ate lots and lots and lots of tall grass. And I'm sorry, dogs shouldn't eat lots and lots and lots of tall grass. Long story short, they spent lots of money to have that impaction removed when we came back from camping and it was a mass of of grass that was just all wound together in his gut so we have to to know what's going in and what's coming out to make sure they're healthy um, and you guys can actually become scatologists if you would like um, because scat can tell you a lot about wild animals too. And the, here's a variety of different books that you can take out with you on a hike. So this one is one of my favorites. It's the Scats and Tracks of the Great Plains. And it's got illustrations of, here's Bullfrog, what a great one to open up to, but it's got illustrations of what their scat would look like. And if they don't leave footprints behind, that may help you know what is in the area. We often have lots of toad scat around places that have outdoor lights because the toads come out and they at night and eat the bugs that fall to the ground. And then you know you've got toads. And I would have to say toads have the most ginormous poops for their body size. It's <laughs> it's pretty impressive that you can have a tiny little toad expel so much fecal matter, but you can look at it and you can see what they've been eating. And I always appreciate when I see June bug parts in their scat because June bugs freak me out. <laughs> so do we have any questions from our audience? Um, yes, we do. We have a couple of also comments about how it's cool that you can learn all these things, but yet it's a little nasty of what you're using to learn that. Um, the One of the ones is how often do you have to pick up their excrement depending on, um, and maybe that depends on the animal or things like that. So he mentioned earlier that 3,500 pounds, how often do they go in and clean out the cages to, to, to do that at, with your um, animals if there's some generalizations you can give? Um, well, here in this department, in the education department, we clean the exhibits each day and remove any fecal matter that we find. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we are all very, very type A. And two, um, because feces can harbor germs that can make people sick, we don't want the animals to come in contact with their feces after they have deposited it because we don't want any of the germs from the feces to be on the animal that may go to a program and may be touched. So we have to um, have a pretty high standard of getting those feces out of the exhibit to keep everything as healthy as possible. But Caleb, what about you guys? How often do you guys go out and clean those yards? We're basically cleaning all the time at yeah. elephants. You have eight elephants. Um, adult elephants can poop up to 50 individual poops a day, so it's a lot. Um, but we'll have a first clean in the morning to go clean our habitats and put elephants out. But then we're coming right back inside the clean, uh, inside holding and inside the barn. And then later on in the day, um, we'll actually go out for a second clean and clean our habitats again. So we're basically cleaning all the time over at elephants. And we know that the worms could cause damage that you guys showed, but what is perhaps the worst thing to find in the animal species? What would be the worst thing that you might see um, from different animals? Um, it depends on what you want to mean by worst. The worst thing that I have found was I found a whole chick foot in a tyra fecal one time, and that was no fun. Um, <laughs> But also otter poop is full of fish bones, which it's supposed to be, but that's also a little off-putting. Um, but really finding any parasites, though it's maybe not a great 
healthy thing for the animal is really fun to find because you feel like you're actually doing your job. Yeah. I can't think of the worst thing I've ever found in any of our animals. Oh, well, I do have a story on that. We, I was a very young, long time ago zoo lady and I was cleaning um, a lizard cage. I don't remember which one. And the feces looked like it had um, like worms or worm eggs in it. And I'm sort of a panic first, figure it out later kind of girl. So of course I call Dr. Wilson on the radio and tell her that there's something wrong with this animal. There's either eggs or worms in its poop and can I bring it down right now? And so she said, of course. And so I took it down there and I, I really think that she had to um, try to not laugh at me because it was cricket eggs. And the cricket eggs were inside the cricket that the animal ate, and it just didn't, didn't digest those eggs. So sometimes you find things that will end up embarrassing you and scat. <laughs> so another question that came up, and I know you mentioned it briefly, um, but could you just reiterate, how do these parasites or worms get into the animals, especially if we're, we're cleaning and things like that? You, you mentioned earlier that you wanna keep them clean so that they don't get them. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how could you just go over briefly again how they would consume and get those parasites or worms in the system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of it is environmental. So these worms go through a life cycle within the animals, but they also go through a life cycle in soil a lot of the times or in other animals that then get eaten by other animals. So to clean the soil of all of the worms, you would have to completely remove all the soil and get Irradiate, new soil, yeah. but then you have new worms. So it's kind of a never ending cycle in some of our animals where we get rid of the worms, but it's in the environment. So the food touches the ground, the worms get in the food, they eat the food, vice versa. Animals are not so picky about, there's some animals under than the meerkats who do latrines. They will poop and eat in the same spot. And so that tends to cause some problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the those worms, the, the, there are worms that can get into our bodies too. Like, um, don't pin worms, can't they come in through our feet if we go? Uh, it seems like you can pick up some kind of worm by going barefoot. Or is that just an old wives' tale to it, keep my shoes on? It is not. You can get what are called translarval migrans, which are worms that are in soil, usually round worms that then oh. get under your skin and can also get other places that are not so great, like your eyeball. Ugh. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad we don't have any pictures of that. We do have another yeah, question. Yeah, pictures of that. That's really <laughs> I only do animals. <laughs> we, we learned from our friend with the amazing jokes that the elephants probably produce the most. What animal do you think at the zoo produces the least? It's going to probably be a reptile, don't you think? Um, yeah, reptiles have a different metabolism than do mammals. Um, so they can go, uh, they can go many months without eating. And if you're not having anything coming in, you're not going to have anything going out. We have a Kenya sand boa who only, really only eats probably six meals a year. And so he doesn't um, produce fecal matter that often he, he will produce urates without fecal matter, but it's gonna be an animal like that, that uh, that's adapted to not eating a lot, and then they're just not gonna have the output. That was a really good question. Do the, um, what other animals kind of compare to the amount produced at the elephants that maybe those um, zookeepers also have to keep up with? Is there another animal that's close to the elephant's output is coming up quite, they're, they're asking that question over and over. Is there another animal that can produce as much? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say not. there's not an animal that quite produces as much poop as an elephant, but their second closest is going to be uh, rhinos. Um, I used to actually be a rhino keeper, um, and usually you're picking up at least a full wheelbarrow of rhino poop a day, if not more. Um, also hippos. Now hippos, uh, their poop, you're just basically um just hosing it down the drain uh, but they do poop a lot 
Oh, and in the wild, they've got quite a trick that they do with their poop. Um, to mark their territory, they will they will poop, but their tail will like spin it out. So it scent mark, scent marks lots of area. So they've got sort of a, a little helicopter poo fling that they do just to mark their area. Um, I, he kind of approached it. Another question is, you know, perhaps some of us have dogs that we go on walks and we're used to picking up their excrement. How do you, it's not giant bags that you're putting over your hand and picking up, but how do you clean out the cages and what tools do you use to physically keep them clean and safe? Yeah, so there's um, just depends on what type of poop you're picking up. Most of the time you'll have either a wheelbarrow or a dump bucket and you'll use a rake and scoop and put it right in there and then you'll take it to we have a line of wheelbarrows and then we have a dump truck that comes and picks up all the wheelbarrows and then they take that dump truck to a compost and that gets sent um, to one person that collects it all. And then um, then a lot of other poop you'll hose down the drains like he was mentioning. It just breaks up too fast. It's very watery and it, you wouldn't get very far trying to rake it. <laughs> So, so, so when you say you ship it off to somebody, like if I'm, if there's 3,500 a day, do you just take that to a trash can and it gets to the garbage dump? Is there somebody using that to compost? What do you do with it after you get it out of the cages? That's another question that they, they're asking. Yeah, it's used for compost. We have one specific person that collects it and it's not given to anyone that wants compost. I don't know if it's the individual myself. But. <laughs> And in, in education, most of our animals are pretty small. So the special tool that I will use a lot of times to, to pick up feces if it's in substrate is an old slotted spoon. I mean, that way I can just pick it up and throw it in the dump bucket and then I take my dump bucket to a wheelbarrow and off it goes. Another question is, is so if I work for the elephants, do you only work with the elephants? Do you only work with one animal? So you're only picking up that type of poop or with the birds, you're only doing it there. Or as a zookeeper, do you um, see more than one animal a day? So you're you're doing different kinds of collections. Yeah, that's a good question. So over at elephants, that's the only animal that we work with. Um, because they do take a lot of work, not only a lot of poop scooping, but a lot of training, enrichment, um, animal husbandry. So there's a lot of work that involves with elephants, uh, but we have a lot of different departments um, that work with a, a lot of different variety of animals as well. Yeah, I think um, I think this department has 20 ish different species, so I think that we probably have the most diverse poop, um, but they're all pretty small, so it's doable. So I, we're down to just a couple minutes. So um, if you're listening, get your questions in. Another question that came up is, that's not all you do. And you you guys very briefly mentioned it too, with you train, you do other things. You're not just scooping all day long. So the joy is there with the interaction of the animals. This is just one of the things that are also part of the job. So could you counteract with the best thing about your day? Um, I don't think it's probably gathering the poop, but it could be just so that they realize it's part of an entire day of what they do. It's not the only thing you do. That is that is absolutely correct. Um, uh, but um, the majority of a keeper's day is cleaning and that includes picking up feces and um, doing dishes and um, feeding and watering the animals. But my favorite part is. Gosh, I have a lot of favorite parts, uh, probably training. We do a lot of training with the animals. Emma, were you going to chime in on that? Yeah, so I work in the tropics building and we have um, a lot of feedings that we do. Since birds are small, they have higher metabolisms. So we're actually feeding out three different times a day. So we do a little bit less poop scooping in the tropics and more feeding since um, if you try to rake up bird poop, it's you're just going to be wasting your time. So we just hose it off. Um, so we do a lot more feeding, but enrichment, I think, would be a big part of my day that I really enjoy. Um, we have a lot of different species in the tropics, so we try to mimic behaviors they would have in the wild. So for one of our um, species called the wood swallows, we throw insects up in the air and they actually swoop down and come get them. So different things like that where you're trying to mimic behaviors that they would see in the wild, that's a big part of my day that I enjoy. Very awesome. So I'm supposed to tell everybody to get ready for a selfie. So as you guys are getting ready for a selfie as you're listening, if you want to um, have everything there, then guys, get your cameras ready. Classroom teachers, they're going to pose and we'll put that up there big. 
And for the one last thing to make sure you get a selfie. Perfect. Um, our time is up. We appreciate the zoo so much in sharing, and there's often a lot of questions around this area, and sometimes we're afraid to ask, but how much you can learn based on this information is really valuable. I'm sure maybe you get used to the smell, maybe not, maybe you have some Vicks under your nose once it happens, but uh, it's definitely, definitely part of the, the everyday job out there at the zoo. So thank you so much. Guys, thank you so much for attending and we will catch you if you're coming to our two o'clock. Bye everyone. You guys look fabulous. Yay.